Who starts? My question is, how can we maintain our own integrity or identity in a relationship, especially a close one, without compromising the integrity of others? Okay. Which you do you want to preserve? <laughs> a lot of different selves. Okay, let me play with it a little bit. When I look at relationships, um, my own and others, um, I see a wide range of reasons for people to be together and ways in which they are together. And um, I see ways in which relationship, which means something that exists between two, two or more people, um, for the most part reinforces people's separateness as, as individual entities. And it doesn't just honor it, it treats it as the reality of it. When um, I perform, or I used to perform, I don't anymore, but I used to perform weddings. I was a marry. I had a license for a while. It was revoked by the temple here, Hanuman Temple. <laughs> Yeah, his was too. <laughs> we used to be able to perform weddings. And um, I do a lot under the table. Uh, used to, um, but it, the image I always have when I'm uh, performing a wedding is the image of a triangle in which there is the, the two partners and then there is this third force, this third being that emerges out of the interaction of these two. And that the third one is the one that is um, the shared awareness that lies behind the two of them. And that the two people in the yoga of relationship come together in order to find that shared awareness that exists behind them in order to then dance as two, so that the two-ness brings them into one and the oneness dances as two. And that, that's a, a kind of a vibrating relationship between the one and the two. So that people are both separate and yet they are not separate. And they're experiencing that the relationship is feeding both their uniqueness as individuals and their unit of consciousness. Now, that's extremely delicate because it's so easy to get entrenched in your own, I need this, I want this, you're not fulfilling this for me, and seeing the other as object. But the delight which all of you have experienced of being with somebody where you are sharing an awareness of the predicament you are both in. And you're sharing an awareness of the predicament even when you're having an argument with each other there's an awareness that you're both almost delighting in the horrible beauty of it. I don't know whether any of you have had that. I've had it quite often, you know. Because I'm around pretty conscious people a lot of the time, and we fight, you know. We have differences. But we're enjoying, we're hating it and enjoying it both, because there's these levels that we're playing at all the time. And... Um, But we come into relationship often very much identified with our needs. I need this. I need security. I need refuge. I need friendship. I need this. And all of relationships are symbiotic in that sense. We come together because we fulfill each other's needs at some level or other. The problem is that when you identify with that, those needs, you always stay at the level where the other person is her or him that is satisfying that need. And it really only gets 
extraordinarily beautiful when it becomes us, and then when it goes behind us and becomes I. <coughs> and so when, you, when I ask you, which person are you saving or protecting, or whose integrity you're protecting, I can see, for example, that I enter into relationships. Um, I understand that to enter into the yoga of relationship is an extremely difficult thing to do. It's the hardest yoga that I know of, actually. Because your ego is so vulnerable when you start to open up to another human being. You feel so tender and so vulnerable. And before that one place gets going strong enough, the, you get frightened and you pull back and you get entrenched. And that happens all the time in relationships. People that come together with the greatest meaning of being, feeling love, and then they get caught in their needs and their frustrations and they separate. One of the problems is that we tend to put relationships a little bit on the back burner in life. We get a relationship and then we go out to a job and we go out to other things and we sort of, now we've got that together, we'll go do life. And for a relationship to be a yoga of relationship is like a full-time operation for years. I mean, uh, for me, one of my examples is uh, Stephen and Andrea Levine. Stephen and Andrea used to be really nice, friendly, sociable people before they met. <laughs> <laughs> this is on a tape, too. <laughs> and then they met. I used to like Stephen. And then, and then they met, and they really started to be together. And um, the amount of energy that had to go into staying clear with each other. Because what happens is so much goes down so fast in relationships it's really hard to process it fast enough to keep clear. So you keep getting this kind of residual of old stuff that isn't quite digested enough, and you end up uh, separate from the person because you didn't have time to stop and kind of work it through, clear it, and so on. So what they did was they moved on to land with no telephone, put up a big sign, no trespassing, and uh, they just started to work with one another. And after some years, during which you really felt like you were cut off as a friend. And it was hard for me, because I had counted on Stephen a lot for sharing consciousness. And then after a while, I began to be, they began to open up to me and allow me in, and then I began to see the effect of that. I began to see what happens when people learn how to really open, trust, meditate together, keep emptying, keep clearing, work until they are a shared awareness. And if you watch them when they're teaching together, when they're on the platform, or when they're together, they are really, they've done some extraordinary work. They still have a lot of work to do. I mean, they're not cooked by any means. But they have done some really good stuff together. And that's hard, and it's rare. It's rare. I, on the other hand, have gone into relationships and realized that I can't hear my own truth in the relationship, and I've had to stop it because I didn't, wasn't willing to surrender the life games that I was in for that relationship. It just wasn't worth the effort. I treasured what I was doing in my life too much to invest in that relationship that deeply. So I've heard it both ways. Do you hear that? Do you want to say? Um, It's, it's not fair to say that any relationship that isn't involved in the yoga of relationship is not useful and fulfilling to people. Because a lot of people come together because it's just really comfortable living with another person and there's a wonderful kind of sweet intimacy and it's fun to cook with each other and fun to sleep together and it's fun to, to just live life together without trying to get too deep in as a spiritual practice. And many of those people have other spiritual practices. They go off and meditate and one, else, one does something else, a Tai Chi or something else. And that seems fine to me. I don't think you should 
make believe that a, a relationship is really yoga unless you're willing to really put the effort into making it such. And if you are, it really fills all the space for a long time. Am I hearing the issue clearly, or do you, somebody want to say anything about that? The, um, when I'm in a relationship with somebody else, and what they do upsets me, Because I understand that my life experiences are the gift of my guru in order to bring me to God, that if somebody upsets me, that's my problem. This is a hard one, because we don't usually think these ways in this culture. What I see other people is, as, I see them as like trees in, in the forest. You go into the woods and you see gnarled trees and live oaks and pines and hemlocks and elms and things like that. And you're not inclined to say, I don't like you because you're a pine and not an elm. You appreciate trees the way they are. But the minute you get near humans, you notice how quick it changes. There's a way in which you don't allow humans to just manifest the way they are. You take it personally. You keep taking other people personally. All they are are me mechanical runoffs of old karma. <laughs> really is what they are. I mean, they look real and they think they're real, but really what they are is mechanical runoff. So they say, Rrr, see, and you karmically go, Rrr. Yeah. And then one of you says, we've got to work this out. And the other says, yes, we must. And then you start to work it out. And it's all mechanical. It's all conditioned stuff. I mean, I'm really being, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Lost one. Uh, So that if somebody, I mean, somebody comes along and gets to me, they get me angry or uptight or they awaken some desire in me. Wow, am I delighted. They got me. And that's my work on myself. If I'm angry with you because your behavior doesn't fill my model of how you should be, that's my problem for having models. No expectations, no upset. If you're a liar and a cheat, that's your karma. If I'm cheated, that's my work on myself. My attempting to change you, that's a whole other ballgame. What I'm saying is I will only be happy if you are different than you are. You're asking for it. Really asking for it. Think of how many relationships you say, I really don't like that person's this. If they would only be this, if I can only manipulate them to be this, I can be happy. Isn't that weird? Why can't I be happy with them the way they are? You're a liar, a cheat, and a scoundrel, and I love you. <laughs> I won't play any games with you, but I love you. It's interesting to move to the level where you can appreciate, love, and allow in the same way you would in the woods, instead of constantly bringing in that judging component, which is really rooted out of your own feelings of lack of power. Judging comes out of your own fear. Now, I fall trapped to it all the time, but every time I do, I catch myself. Okay, that's the beginning. Let's go. Question. Are you on board yet, or are you still here? Yes? No? Okay.
If you don't give me feedback, I'm going home. The hell with you all. <laughs> Okay, let's go. <laughs> a problem seems to be that when you're in a relationship in the beginning, everything is accepted. But then if you marry that person, all of a sudden judgment's coming on a continuous basis. And uh, that's a problem, which leads to my question. Hold the mic, by the I have been um, in several relationships in my life, major relationships, and um, been married and divorced twice. And I'm searching for something special, something I've been told is called a soulmate. <laughs> Do you believe in such a relationship or person? And what would that mean? How would I know that? Cut it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> keep looking. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the farthest out answer, first of all, and then we'll come back to something that everybody can handle. <laughs> In the farthest out answer, we have all been around so many times that every one of us has been everything with everybody else. So when I look at you, you and I have been in so many relationships together, it's just we don't remember. Do you know how many times we've been born and died? Remember that story Buddha says? If you take a mountain six miles long, six miles wide, six miles high, that's the, the distance a bullock walks in a day. And a bird flies over the mountain once every hundred years with a silk scarf in its beak. In the length of time it takes the scarf to wear away the mountain. That's how long you've been doing this. I mean, just think of that. Once every hundred years, the scarf goes over. A scarf and a mountain. Okay. It goes on and on and on and on. I mean, in India, there are yugas and kalpas of hundreds of thousands of years. Of, and, and then they just start cycles all over again. And we've been through all of them again and again and again and again. Now... Behind all of it is the one, and that's all there is. This is all, all of us here are one in drag appearing to be many. So we are all soul mate. There's only one of it. It's not mate because it's not even two, it's just one. There's only one of us. So what you're really doing is constantly marrying yourself at the deepest level of God marrying God, right? Now you come down into soul. And each soul has a unique karmic predicament. Uh, you could call it a psychic DNA code that in a way guides which way its life will go. And it is entirely possible that souls, when they take birth in parents, in, into parents that are part of their karma, will at some point meet a being and they have agreed in advance to come down and do this together and meet. And that's what we usually call soulmates. What you have found from your past marriages is that what you are attracted to in a person isn't what you ultimately live with. That what the, after the, they say the honeymoon is over, and that it's after the desire systems that were dominant in the relationship that have the attraction in it pass and all of it passes, 
then you're left with the work to do. And it's the same work. When you trade in one partner for another, you still have the same work. You're going to have to do sooner or later when the pizzazz is over. And it just keeps going over. And you can't, you can't milk the romanticism of relationship too long as you become more conscious. It's more interesting than that. It really is. And people keep wanting to romanticize their lives all the time. Culture, though, isn't it? It's part of the culture. But the awakening process starts to show you the emptiness of that form. And you start to go for something deeper. You start to go to meet another human being in truth. And truth is scary. Truth has bad breath at times. Truth is boring. <laughs> truth, you know, burns the food. Truth is all, all the stuff. Truth has anger. Truth has all of it. And you stay in it, and you keep working with it, and keep opening to it, and keep deepening it. And every time you trade in a partner, you realize that that's all, it's not, there's no good or bad about it. I'm not talking good or bad about this. But you begin to see how you keep coming to the same place in relationships. And then you tend to stop because it gets too heavy, because your, your identity gets threatened too much. Because for the relationship to move to the next level of truth requires an opening and a vulnerability that you're not quite ready to make. And so you entrench, you retrench, you pull back, and then you start to judge and push away, and then you move to the next one. And then you have the rush of the openness, and then the same thing starts to happen. And so you keep saying, where am I going to find the one where this doesn't happen? And it'll only happen when it doesn't happen in you. When you start to take and watch the stuff and get quiet enough inside yourself so you can take that process as it's happening and start to work with it and keep coming back to living truth in yourself with the other person, even though it's scary and hard. You hear the, what I'm talking about? So... The other person has to work with you. In that well, that's interesting. The ideal, of course, is where two people work together. But in, like in India, where many marriages are arranged, and you don't even see your wife until after the wedding. I mean, <laughs> they wear masks at the wedding in some, color, in some villages. I don't know what they do in southern India, in North... Krishna and Radha, they wear masks. And then they take off the mask and there they are for life because there's no divorce. I mean, you just don't divorce in a village if, if, uh, if the husband dies, the wife goes on the funeral pyre. And so this is it. This is it for life. It's, it's got its benefits. <laughs> But what's interesting about that is that when they understand dharma of relationship, there is a way in which it's like what the Marines say, that if you can change it, you, can, you change it, and if you can't, paint it. <laughs> and when you can't change a marriage, you start to work with it. I thought it was a standstill painting. <laughs> well, it's the same. <laughs> you can't move it. The, the, when you have something that you're in, like I couldn't trade my father in for another father. He was given to me. That's the given. I can't divorce my father. I can go away from him, but I can't divorce him. And what I found was, because I had to keep dealing with my father, who called me rum dum and who, you know, he, he loved me a lot, and he thought I was very sweet and well-meaning, and, and we were buddies. And, but it was weird, because he didn't really understand what I was doing. And um, <laughs> he attended a, a, a gathering in New York on the Central Park West where Judith works also in a church where they have Christ washing the feet of the disciples on the mural in the back wall. He was back there with my stepmother-to-be, and I was up there in a white robe with beads. Did I tell you this? Oh. And he, he whispered to her, he says, I feel like the Virgin Mary, <laughs> which for a Jew is pretty good. <laughs> but she was, so it's okay. Um, we forget that, don't we? <laughs> but uh, Dad was interesting work for me because he was a given. I couldn't trade in. In the last years, I was with him a lot. And um, 
And I began to see that that was work on myself to not judge him, not to try to change him. He was what he was. He was a perfect statement of dad. He was absolutely perfect who he was. It was only when I had a model of how I would like my father to be that there was trouble. I wanted him not to suffer when death, so I wanted him to understand what I understood about dying. And he didn't want to understand it. <laughs> and I was frustrated because I meant well. I knew if he understood it, he wouldn't suffer. The worst problem is trying to take the suffering away from people you love. That's the stinker. You keep wanting to take away their suffering. And you don't even know why it's there in the first place. It's so interesting to allow people to be who they are. Finally, I think in relationships, you create an environment with your own work on yourself, which you offer to another human being to use to grow in the way they need to grow. Parents are an environment for their children. Lovers are an environment for their partners. Children are an environment for their parents. And you keep working. You become the soil, moist and soft and receptive, so the person can grow the way they need to grow. Because how do you know how they should grow? People have two children. One of them is a very old incarnation, an old llama, who just dropped down to bless everybody. And the other one is immediately post-Neanderthal. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're siblings, and they are my children, you know, and they're two entirely different two beings. So you've just got to listen to hear what a human being needs, who they need to be in a lifetime. So when you work with a situation where you don't change it, you just work on yourself a different way. The idea of manipulating the universe in order for you to be happy is just one model. The other model is manipulate your own mind till you're happy with what you got. Which is probably the only way to do it. Finally, that's the only way to do it. Because if you keep manipulating the environment, it's never right. Did you never notice that thing? I mean, I've gone to... I'll go to Kauai and, well, you know, in Hawaii, rent a house, get a car, have a lover, get art supplies, get fish, get... Mm, yeah. But do you notice the weather is a little clammy today? <laughs> damn it, the Jeep they gave us, it's not running on all the cylinders. That damn restaurant was closed tonight. I mean, I can watch how you can create an absolute hell out of the whole thing that was to be heaven and paradise. And then you just laugh at yourself. And then finally, the, the image I have, which I've told so many times, um, of being in, in Borelli at the railway station in India, when I realized the train was going to be two days late. <laughs> and the station was full of people who had, were living there. And these were families with kids that were peeing everywhere, and they had goats and chickens and vendors selling everything. I mean, it's life. It's real life in the Borelli railway station. And I didn't have much money at that time, and I had, I was barefoot because I was a yogi in those days. And the latrine, I had uh, dysentery, and the latrine hadn't, it had stopped up maybe, oh, a few weeks before. And so the fecal matter was sort of everywhere. And there were flies, I mean, millions of flies. And I had to go about every 15 minutes. And now my mother raised me. Um, she, uh, she had very definite models of toilet training, and she taught me she taught me what hell was. And the closest to hell of her mind was the Borelli railway station latrine. I mean, if she had ever seen it, that would be she would realize she had she had met her fantasy. Right? And there I was. It was interesting because. I found myself sitting there, knowing I had to go to the bathroom, feeling it coming, and knowing I had to go in there, and then coming back, and then sitting there. I just got toilet paper. <laughs> but no 
Close the door to see Claire has a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> And there was a moment when I realized, in the midst of all that, that I was happy. And I thought, this is impossible. Everything my training prepared me for was to not be happy at this moment. And I'm happy. And it was interesting. I was happy because there was, there was life force, there was openness, there were people, there was realness, there was softness, it was alive. And also because I was really at peace in myself. And this was just the stuff to deal with. And in a way, that experience shifted my consciousness about manipulating the universe to be happy. I'll still make it as nice as I can for me. But then where it isn't, I don't sit around being preoccupied with what isn't. Love it. Just open to it. Ah, so, and here we go. Here we go. Because the amount of time you create a hell with your own mind because of your attachments to your models of how it should be that are different from the way it is. You can see it in this culture about growing old. You see the model that a person develops about themselves. And then as their body changes, which is inevitably part of nature, how it disconfirms their model and how they suffer. Because I used to do 100 push-ups, and now I can only do 70. And there's a deep depression. That interesting. I can't even do one. <laughs> and I'm not depressed. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> Next question. I find that um, when I'm dealing with pain or anger or fear, um, especially when I'm sharing it with somebody, I do a manipulation thing where I think I'm, I'm facing, I'm facing it, but a lot of it gets pushed down pushed inside. Down. And so my question, I guess, is how to really keep open to those things and, and without playing that game with them. You're talking about manipulating them or yourself? Do you feel you're selling out to be with them or do you feel that you're trying to manipulate them? To... What are you telling me? It's not, it's not a real conscious thing. It's a... It's an ego, too. <laughs> well, most everything we do is on this plane. It's hard not to be. I mean, the spirit is mediated through ego. It's just a question of how identified you are with it. To tell me these things in yourself is acknowledging the fact that you see them at some level. And when you're with another partner that you're really trying to work with, by acknowledging that stuff with each other, it doesn't mean that you have to extract something from them. It's just that the relationships that are the most exciting are where the contract is to share truth. Many relationships don't have that kind of a contract. They have a contract of you won't threaten my ego and I won't threaten yours. We'll both feel comfortable. But if the relationship is designed where you agree and agree, let us... When I say to you, will you help me awaken by sharing your truth with me? It may be difficult for me to hear it, but that's the work I will do with myself. And then you say to me, would you help me awaken through sharing your truth with me? Sometimes it'll be hard for me, but I'll work on myself with it. That relationship gets very exciting. That gets loaded. That's, that's juicy. I mean, Jai and I have been friends for many years, and we have that contract. 
And sometimes it's been hard. There have been moments when his truth to me has been painful for me to work with, as mine has been to him. But we trust each other because we're both committed to awakening, because we both love Maharaji so much, that we take that truth and we keep working it and working with it. It's the same in my relation with Judith, who I've been with for many years. Same way. Now, those kinds of truth relationships are very precious. They're very delicate, but you, anything less than the truth. So what you do is when you see that stuff in yourself, you can say to the other person, I see how I am manipulating. And you just keep bringing it out. And the two of you bring it out and examine it with good faith. You keep doing that. You keep working and get as close as you can with it. And if the relationship doesn't allow that, then the work has got to be in yourself of bringing it up and seeing the way you're doing it. I mean, I have a very manipulative quality in me that I have had to work with a lot over the years to the point where when I see myself doing it, either somebody points it out to me or I begin to see myself doing it. And then the interesting question is, what do you do with that moment? Do you get into, oh, you're a no good bum because you're doing that again? Or do you just kind of let it go and let it float by? Ah, so there I am again. Manindra, who was one of my wonderful meditation teachers, once I came to him and I was so upset about something. And he says, Ram Das, don't you see it's just old karma running off? And I really heard that. It's just old stuff out of us running off. Bring it up, look at it, and let it go. Okay? Yes. My question is unheard. My question, is unheard. My question has to do with um, the relationship of student to spiritual teacher, and it has to do with. Um, one view is that the student should never accept blindly what the teacher puts on them or tells them. That one should check it out to look them in themselves. One should uh, go through it. And the other view is one should totally surrender their being to the teacher. Now, if you are the student and you're in this kind of situation, which way do you go? Know? How do you know what to do? I think you surrender only to truth. And your intuitive heart has to be the final arbiter of where the truth lies, the final judge of where the truth lies. And you're surrendering to, what you're surrendering to is God in the form of another person. And there are often times where, because most of the beings that we call gurus are really teachers. The likelihood of finding somebody that's a cooked goose is reasonably slim. Since they're not cooked geese, they have their own karma. They have their own stuff. And so they become somebody through whom a teaching comes. But they themselves are not truth. They are merely a vehicle through which, if there is a purity in your heart in the way you seek truth, you will take, as the, as the swan is able to separate milk from water, you separate the purity of their message from the stuff of their karma. And you take the truth and you work with it. So my, like, some teachers will say, I've given you so much, you owe, you've got to do this for me. I would say the only thing you owe a teacher is for you to get enlightened or free. That's all you owe them. Because they're doing it out of the grace and good fortune that they're able to do it, and that should be enough for them. You don't owe them to take care of them. You may want to out of your love for them, but there's not an obligation in that sense. My sense is that that when we surrender to a teacher and then end up feeling burned by their impurities, 
there was a conspiracy between the teacher and you for everybody to do themselves in through each other. And everybody's getting their car muffins. I have watched this again and again because there is a whole panoply of impurity in the teaching scenes. What if you don't feel that, though? What if you feel that no matter what happens? Would you talk about the microphone? What if you don't feel that? What if you feel that? <clears throat> The teacher themselves is very pure. If there's any impurity, it's coming from your lack of knowledge, and you don't feel that. If you intuitively feel that, then you listen and you go as close to surrender as you can go. But you've got to hear that the, the final spiritual surrender is no surrender. It's a surrender where there's nothing to surrender because you are a... Because the highest thing in the other person is the same as the highest thing in you. I don't know that yet. No, but you're surrendering constantly into the highest part of your truth. And intuitively, there's a place in you that does know that. <laughs> Even though you don't know, you know it. So that you're making approximations, and what you may do is fall on your face. Well, I figure if one goes to surrender, but one's really going to get burned. The fact is that you can't really decide to surrender. Because that's just another trip of power. I'm surrendering to you, you know. Give me the truth. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The relationship between a pure master and a chela is a matter that has nothing to do with the intellect whatsoever. There's no choice involved in it at all. That is such deep karmic unfolding that you are drawn to the master when the moment is right and the unfolding happens totally at a level where when it's right, you just, ah, 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 ah. And all the should I or shouldn't I, you know. I recall I was traveling with um, a swami who was a very beautiful man and we traveled around the world together. And then I came to his ashram, and it was a very big ashram, and he, 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 he sat on a throne, and he had many wealthy devotees and many poor devotees. And he created a little throne for me next to his throne. And thousands of people came to see him, and he made all of these people touch my feet, and there were judges and wealthy people, and they gave me coconuts, and they put flowers around my neck. And, and he had me have attendance, and he gave me special rooms. And it was really lovely. People came up to me, and they said, you know, he's never treated anybody like this before. Um, you had a guru up on the mountains, him. But, um, you know, he was nice to start you going, but this is clearly your master. And I thought about my guru up in the mountains who had a blanket that kept falling off. Now, um, in most relationships, the relationships are based on a conspiracy to stay separate. It's based on the idea, you're you and I'm me, and we will interact. We won't merge, we will interact. So the merging is a whole other game that is not part of the usual social contract at all. And when you come together in a marriage or in a relationship uh, with a partner, even that isn't based on merging usually. It's based on a, a partnership of egos, of I won't threaten your ego and you don't threaten mine and we'll do very well together. Thank you. To do it as a, as a technique for merging is very difficult because it involves a surrender that has uh, and a relationship that attempts to be a relationship that is a yoga form often walks the fine line between chaos and cosmos because it's very scary since it doesn't have the protective device of a conspiracy to keep separate it starts to get dealing with the issues of surrender and very often, if you start to choose a yoga of relationship, that becomes your primary yoga. You can't use that along with other yogas. It's just, it becomes your main method because it, it takes most of your time. 
You can't have a relationship and put it in the back burner and then go do other things and call it the yoga of relationship. Most people have relationships that they find get make as comfortable as they can make and then go do some other yoga like meditation. So the dance, as I said earlier today, is like a triangle in which there is the, the two that come together in order to know the one and then the one dances as two. So it's, it's a very vibrating thing. It's the two energies bringing them into the one and the one dancing as the two. And it goes like this all the time. So when you make a marriage that is designed to be a technique to bring you to God, you are using the other person to see through the veil of separateness. So then what do you look at? Because you come together attracted by body or attracted by personality or attracted by comfort or security or whatever. And then through meditation technique, you have to look through that veil to see beyond that and see beyond that. And you practice looking through the veils of other people. That's the yoga of relationship, roughly. And so the art is to extricate yourself from identification with your somebodyness and extricate the person you're seeing from their identification with their somebodyness. So it is really nobody meeting nobody. And then when nobody meets nobody, there is emerging. And the minute there's any somebodyness at all in the whole thing, it can't happen. The minute the awareness is identified with anything, it makes it solid. And you can feel after a while when you meet a liquid consciousness and when you meet a solid. It's amazing. And after a while, you walk in and you meet, a, you meet people and you can feel the liquidity. You can feel that the awarenesses just keep merging all the time. And yet there are forms, but nobody's invested in them. Nobody's playing them. Nobody's seriously involved in form. And that becomes the yoga you're working with all the time. So your job is to keep working on yourself to extricate yourself from your somebodyness and at the same moment seeing through the veil of somebody else's somebodyness to the one that lies behind the many. And you can practice levels of this. For example, you can look at me now and you can see my body. You can see me as a 58-year-old... Um, um, attractive, uh, uh, balding gentleman. Um, then you can shift your gaze and see my personality, and you can see me as a, a, a teacher, as warm, as charismatic, as blah, whatever, you know, as slightly neurotic, whatever. Then you can shift your gaze once more, and you can see that I'm an Aries. You can see that I'm my astral mythic identity. Then you can shift once more and you can look and you can see that I'm a fellow soul. You there, I'm here. What are you doing in that one? And when you see me as a fellow soul, you see me as a soul packaged in this astral personality body matrix. Just a soul that came into this. And we just, all of us are just souls hanging out in these funny packages. And each package has its own trip to live out. And then if you flip it once more, you look and you're looking at yourself, looking at yourself. There's only one of it. This is the yoga of relationship. Yes. And how does it compare to a monastic or a, a single life? Um, I think that you've got to really get over the cultural models that everybody is to have a partner or everybody is to be alone to get to God. I think relationship is a very hard yoga. I think it's a hard yoga because it's so easy to get caught because it gets so frightening to get so close to the, to the, to the void with another human being because you feel so vulnerable on the way through to your invulnerability. And so that most yoga or most relationships end up agreeing to settle for something or other. They run out of will to keep breaking through. And they can, they can settle for some very beautiful things, but it's a really hard one to keep at it all the time. And uh, uh, so 
marriage and family, I think, are certainly roots to God, but they are difficult roots. They're difficult roots. But a single... See, what you've got to do is you've got to hear what your own incarnation's function, role and function, what your soul needs from a birth. If, you're, if you are to marry and have children and you resist it, you will feel out of harmony with things. If you marry and have children and you are really a single yogi, you will feel out of sorts with it too. And you've just got to listen and feel your way through that because there's just no rule for the game. Each person has their own unique uh, dharma. Question. Um, I'm an energy on many different relationships. And my question is, do we have such a thing, do I have such a thing as a soulmate? And I was just wondering if perhaps you could give me a telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a sign-up list for this gentleman outside. Um, first of all, when you say wasted, you didn't waste them. After a while, you begin to see that your journey, spiritual journey, as you awaken more and more, you begin to understand what was going on in all the stuff beforehand. Like, I had periods in my adolescence that were hell realms for me. I mean, that I was extremely unhappy and miserable and lonely and isolated. And now, in perspective, from as I look back, I see the way those things drove me inside to certain parts of my being. And they deepened my compassion, they deepened my awareness, they did a lot of things for me. I wouldn't lay them on anybody and I wouldn't want to repeat them. But I now see that it was process. And in a way, don't look back at your life, don't look at things as wasted parts of your life. Just say, maybe I don't understand yet what the meaning of it was, but understand it's all process. People don't fall off the path in the real sense of the path. It's a continuous process, right? Um, the only way you would know a soulmate if you met one was if you were residing in your soul. As long as you're in your personality, it's all a little game, the whole idea of soulmates, which is used a lot in this culture. You know, I want my soulmate. That's a personality speaking. And it, it takes one to know one, if you will, right? And uh, what you will feel at times is you'll feel an incredible familiarity with somebody when you meet them. And you will feel that we are connected to each other, even though we haven't known each other in this life. But that's probably true. There's probably only about 500 of us in the world anyway. And we just keep going around again. And that we've all known each other many times in many ways. I mean, I have a feeling we... That it's said that everybody was everybody's mother and father and child and murderer and murdery and all sorts of things. So you get so that you're a surprise when you feel these complex emotions regarding other human beings. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the term soul mate other than people have work to do together at times. And um, um, then they may come together in many different forms. You may come together with a brother or a sister or a mother or a cousin or an employer, employee that have incredible work together. I mean, Judas and Jesus had work to do together. They could have been soul mates. In that sense, yes. Yeah, and I don't have any phone numbers for you. But I... It's a big group, so we're not going to take questions now. Okay. Go ahead, except for the group until we get done. Who's next? Is there a difference between marriage and just living together? Is there a difference between marriage and just live and we'll forget the word just. Is there a difference between marriage and living together? Well, it really depends on which culture you're living in. 
Um, for example, in the villages in India, when you get married, it is till death. And if one person dies, the other person lives in mourning for the rest of their life uh, and doesn't remarry. Well, that's not true for the men. It's true for the women, which is a very sexist thing, of course. Um, in fact, in some cultures, the women goes on the funeral pyre for the, when the man dies. But there's no divorce. It's, it's not heard of. But that's because the culture isn't focused on personality so much. In California, where I live, um, <laughs> it is serial monogamy. That is, you only are married to one person at a time but you can be married serially, and marriage has come to be a special friendship. See, the difference between these different models are your parents are your given karma. You can't trade them in. You can't turn in your father and get a new one. And then you have friends that are acquired karma. Okay? Those, are, those are people you take on, and you work with them, and then if it doesn't work, you can go on to somebody else. Now, where does a marriage fit in between given karma and acquired karma? In some cultures, it's given karma. The minute you make the contract, it's till death do us part. When you say till death do us part, it then has become given karma in the same way that a parent is. It's nothing you can turn in. Now, what marriage has come to be in the West is much more like a special friendship where you take it on and work with it, and then if you both find you're incompatible, you go on to somebody else. From a spiritual point of view, ideally, you would find a partner who wished to awaken, and you wished to awaken, and the two of you would use the relationship in order to awaken, and you would use your raising of children and the, your lifestyle, and you're working with your money and all of it as a way of awakening. That would be the ideal. Okay. If you end up in a marriage where you got married before you started to awaken, or you got married and then you find that one person doesn't want to awaken and another does, doesn't want to work on himself and another does, then the person that wants to awaken has really a choice. You can see that relationship as given karma and work with it. Or you can say, I really want my marriage to be satsang or sangha, so I will give this one up and try another one. I'll find somebody who wants to work with me. Right? It actually, from a spiritual point of view, you're going to grow both ways. From a psychological point of view, it might be harder being married to somebody that's not the least bit interested in what you're interested in. You go to retreats all by yourself, and they don't care, and they don't want to meditate, and they want to look at the ball game. And... But if from, in terms of your work on yourself, that will get you there just as fast as... as uh... And what you usually find is when you keep trading in your partners, the next partner you get, you will slowly make the relationship over into what you had last time anyway. I mean, because these are happening on much deeper levels of unconsciousness. I mean, if you're neurotic in, in London, you'll probably be neurotic in Paris. You know, it's not like suddenly you're going to move or shift people and it's all going to be roses. It'll still, you'll still have to deal with the stuff of your attachments of mind. So after a while, you don't really care so much who you're with. You just keep doing it. Um, you could say that a marriage contract deepens the commitment to go through the suffering together. The problem is, I think, from, forget the problem, my sense is that love is the only marriage contract and that people should stay together so long as they want to be together in love. And that to be together with somebody because you signed a paper at one time does not seem to me to be a valid reason to stay together. I, I don't hear that. Okay. Now, uh, um, and all of the vacillation when you're living with somebody, shall we marry, shouldn't we marry, that's just grist for the mill of spiritual work on oneself about what the issues of commit, because what does commitment mean? Commitment means, says, this is a useful process for us to be working on ourselves through. From a spiritual point of view, that's what it's saying. And uh, 
That doesn't have to be a contract between two people. That is e something each person makes a decision to do about their life. So. I know some of you are upset by that, but that's okay. Question. Um, this follows what you just said. Um, can you make a distinction? Um, I know some Tibetan masters who have wives, and it would seem as if their relationship with their wife is not particularly conscious. You know, she stays in the kitchen and, you know, is in a pretty traditional sense and washes the dishes and they don't talk. Um, though th this master is very busy teaching consciousness and would travel all over the world. Um, She's probably the Buddha. She's, yeah. I... Uh, and he, he's just the front man. Well, exactly. I mean, I think what I'm saying, Gramdas, is there a dis distinction? The sacrament is the chicken soup. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Excuse me. Go ahead. Um, I mean, is there a distinction between a path that is yoga? of relationship as a way to God and being a spiritual warrior on the way to God and as part of that having a conscious supportive relationship but that is not the primary yeah. focus. Yeah, I think that most um, people that are in spiritual work... Because it's too hard it, the, to the do... Marriage, the relationship yeah. yoga is such a stinker. Yeah. that the best thing to do is to form a marriage that gives you support and gives you intimacy and all of the things you need and it's, it's comfortable and safe and secure and it's a base camp and then you do your practices. And as you both do your practices, you get, you get clearer and closer together, but the yoga of relationship wasn't the primary yoga. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's a very valid thing to do. I think that's a more intelligent strategy than trying to make the relationship the yoga, to tell you the truth. Because um, this is a question I've discussed with some people, is um, I was recently getting married and I ended it um, because I was saying I really want to go to God and to look in your eyes and my partner just wanted another gin and tonic and I sort of ended up um, it was quite impossible to do the work and yet I see that I had probably intended something that wasn't my soul nature to go much too high that was even higher than I could probably do and so somehow I sacrificed myself whereas you know I just could have chosen a nice middle of the road with a little bit of personality comfort and coming to retreats as well. <laughs> I mean, like... <laughs> I mean... No, I mean... I think she just... escaped just in time. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, I'm putting myself up as a scapegoat, but for many years I have really um, tried to live a very rigorous spiritual relationship. And there was always the pain because I would deny myself certain things that I had not, as it were, evolved enough to not need. Yeah. And, um, you see, it also begs the question that if one is on the spiritual path, is one necessarily of a different vibrational rate than someone who isn't? Or is that yet another glamour? I mean, because, quote, I'm on the spiritual path, therefore I can't be with so-and-so because they're not... Um, I think that I hear your point, and I think most of the time that we use the spiritual path concept 
as a way of giving ourselves some status in our own mind, and it's a little fraudulent. Yeah, yeah. and I think that um, somebody that is really working spiritually in the deepest sense will just use everything in their life. They'll use the gin and tonic, they'll use the they'll use the not marrying and the marrying and they just quietly keep using everything they can use as a process and they don't make a big deal of it they do it in a way they do their spiritual practices behind the uh, screen in a way of life and they just seem like regular people doing it they, the whole showbiz part of spirituality is a little showbiz and finally you you let that go and you're just nothing special you know I agree totally. Yeah. But also, Ramdas, isn't the, you know, someone who does work on themselves and someone who doesn't, if they get together, there is a kind of difference. You know, but for, it's for the person, very difficult. But for the person who is working on themselves, that is very good stuff to work with. That's very good stuff to work with. I mean, it's just a fire. It's a hotter fire. It's a hotter fire. So if I want to go to God, I really choose my next part to love gin and tonic. But... No, I wouldn't. I, I would try to make it easy for yourself because you could fall. I mean, not fall off, but you could, you know, <laughs> get into the olives or onions by error, you know. I think that you... Uh, what you would do is you would find, you look around and you, see, you find somebody who shares your journey as well as you can. But then if you find after you marry that you're with somebody who primarily is on the gin and tonic yoga, <laughs> then you work with that. That's what you work with. That's all I'm suggesting. Right? Because you were attracted to that person in the first place. And the problem is you've got to look for the truth of where you are. A lot of people, for example, say, I'm on the spiritual path, when in fact, really what they want to do is have good sex. But they don't want to admit it so that they are attracted to somebody that wants good sex, and then they put them down in order to not identify with what they themselves really want. So at least be straight with yourself. If that's what you want, that's what you want. It's better to be truthful than to be holy to be phony holy, all right? We have enough trouble with that. And that, you'll, that'll just blow you away, phony holiness. I mean, it just keeps, you gotta go back. Go back to go and start again and start, okay? Next. On the question of more um, open relationships, I'm not, I'm not saying committed married uh, relationships, um, we seem to be limited in our ability to express the impulses that stem from deep within, uh, deep within oneself. Is this um, inability a limitation inherited through the mores of culture, or is it a, a human limitation, and uh, thereby meaning we must always be alone with this? Wait a minute, you've got to start this one again. This is a okay. very <laughs> complex one. Say it, start again. Say okay. it over now. I'm not talking about... You're talking about open marriage. Open I'm not talking about um, marriages, or I'm talking about relations. Relationship. With others. With others, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We seem limited in our ability to express the um, impulses that stem from deep within ourselves. Is this limitation inherited through our culture? Or is it a basic human limitation and if if it is must we always be as it were alone with our experience uh, I think our inability to express our uh, to acknowledge our impulse life is primarily a socialization process it's the process of culture um, and I think that it's the way in which we get acculturated so that a society can function. It's because it's a, a society has a hard time when there's immediate impulse expression for everybody all the time. It needs a certain amount of delay of gratification, a certain amount of control, a certain amount of actually 
suppression, not necessarily repression, but it usually ends up repression. Um, it is certainly possible to work with truth in a relationship to get to the point where more and more you are safe in expressing what your impulses are and your truth of your moment. Truth is one of the vehicles for deepening spiritual awareness through another human being. And if there is a license for that in, the relation, in any relationship, with guru, with friend, with lover, with whatever it is, it is a, an absolutely optimum way of coming into a liquid spiritual relationship with another person. But it's very, very uh, delicate because people are, um, feel very vulnerable. They have parts of their mind that are cut off. That the, imp the idea that's been socialized is, if I show this part of me, I would not be acceptable. And the ability to risk that, finally, you learn how to have your truth available. It doesn't mean you have to force your truth on anybody, but if you find somebody else that is willing to enter into a contract of truth with you, then you can share that and you can get closer and closer to the impulses. It doesn't mean you have to act on the impulses. I mean, I can say, I have, I've had, I, the impulses have risen in me that I would like to see uh, you know, you cut into pieces if I felt that, or I'd like to make love with you or something like that. And that might not be socially acceptable or might not fit in with your model of reality. But if I feel safe enough, I can share that truth with you. And as you and I share those truths more and more, then our entrapment in our minds gets less and less. And we are able to allow the awareness to flow back and forth between us because we're both looking from the same place at our human condition together. The impulse, the repression of impulse is what blocks energy and what keeps other people as them rather than us. And the idea is to get to the point where you really live with us, not with them. Not with him or with her, but with us. And finally, if you're really doing the yoga part of it, with I. There is only an I in many forms. Do you hear that? So truth is one of the exciting vehicles to work with with relationship. And what I've learned is to use my lecture role to make my truth as available as I possibly could. And what I find is people say to me, thank you for being so truthful. It makes it easier for me to be truthful about myself because you've done that. And I think, well, it's, it's a cheap price to offer yourself up for that purpose if, it, if that just in itself starts to help other people. Okay, is that dealing with the question? No. I want to go back one second to the issue of committed relationships. You can enter into a contract with somebody that says we will not have relationships with other people while we are together. And that will allow for a certain kind of safety and a certain kind of deepening. I think it, uh, I can hear that as a very viable thing. You could equally enter into a relationship which says we'll have an open marriage and we will work with it. Uh, if you, I think the, a contract between human beings should be honored. I think that creates an environment that's safe for inner work. Uh, it doesn't matter which contract it is, as long as it's a, a contract that's on it. And when you want to renegotiate the contract, you say, I want to renegotiate the contract. You don't renegotiate it unilaterally. You don't decide you're not going to fulfill the contract and then go off and do something else on your own. It has to be honorable between people. Yeah. Those create the conditions for, for more subtle inner work, where you can play it, you can go deeper and be safer. More questions from this group? Yeah. Are you okay. Um, you, you mentioned earlier something about sexism, and I wondered if you think that men and women have got similar challenges at this time on the planet to, to awaken through relationships, or if you think that, that they're different. <clears throat> I 
I think this is a very interesting time for women um, because um, the history of religious traditions has for the most part treated men and women very differently and um, in India for example the way a relationship is seen is that the woman has two forces that are very powerful in her one is that she most easily can get into a transcendent state because of her chemistry that in her uh, menstrual cycle she can get out there are a lot of ways she can get out of her worldliness but she also has a very powerful earth pull because of the nesting need so that they see a woman as having these two forces very strong and they experience the man as having much less of an earth or nesting pull but tending to get much more caught in the mind and not having the energy to get out so what they see a marriage is as the wife is the shakti or energy which gives the relationship sufficient juice for the man to get out then he isn't pulled back so hard and then he can keep her out so that they see that as a team venture he can't get out without her she can't stay out without him and that's the way historically that was understood in the marriage okay? and it was in when you understood that you understood why in in India most of the stories the historical stories of the saints revolved around the men who ended up in caves rather than the women because the men once they got out there there wasn't anything pulling them back to earth as much because they didn't have this dual function in life of reproduction of, uh, of, of taking care of their young now um, that was an excuse for a culture that really didn't give women the opportunity for spiritual practices that were that should have been available to all human beings and what we're finding now and there certainly were plenty of examples take Ananda Mai Ma or uh, Mirabai or many many uh, Teresa or people like that there have been many many women who have certainly come as close to enlightenment as men have come and in, in, in terms of their spiritual work um, so now it seems to me that the whole situation has opened up and you're taking cultural traditions that had a, a sex difference and you're trying to redefine them in a way that gives everybody equal opportunity the predicament is you can't confuse equal opportunity you mustn't let that mask the fact that there are differences in biochemistry and there are differences in the function of an incarnation and there are differences between men and women in why a being takes an incarnation as a woman and as a man and it's not lesser it's just different these are different functions so that I think what happened in our societies most recently I can see it in in the United States that when the women's movement started or feminism whatever that was called that women's movement that women interpreted equality as being equally in the mind as men were and they in many ways started to reject the qualities of them that were part of the reason for their incarnation they started to get alienated from their own truth in order to have equal opportunity in the business marketplace or something like that that seemed to me to be an immature level of equality and as time has gone on it seems to me that it's maturing a great deal so that women are beginning to hear that they have a choice they have freedom to choose and they have freedom to honor their uniqueness rather than to mask their uniqueness and so that we can arrive at the way and in fact it seems to me that in Europe 
men and women have a much deeper intuitive sense of their maleness and femaleness than they do in the United States. In the United States, there seems to be much more of a kind of a superficial macho-ness in men and a kind of a um, hysterical femininity in women that isn't coming from the deep truth of their beings. Now, in terms of spiritual truth, what you notice, it's interesting, in the, in the gurus, that as the gurus get further out, most of the men start to develop breasts. This is interesting. And the, um, there is a quality of androgyny in spiritual identity that is um, not social, but it's at some very deep level at which you are the mother and the father. And that happens to both women and men. I mean, Ananda Mai Ma, who was an incredibly delicate and graceful being, was also an incredibly fierce and strong woman. And you could feel that both those forces were acting in her. And Maharaji, my guru, was incredibly tender and also extremely fierce. And I can feel that the qualities that we attribute to women and men often start to merge in beings as they get more evolved spiritually. So, I think that um, men have, in the terms of the religious traditions, they have a more clearly enunciated spiritual path. Women have got to, it seems to me, have, start, have still a time now to be very creative about how they work with these paths in terms of what is true and what isn't true and what is appropriate to take from another tradition and what must be created on its own. And, what, and it's going to take several generations for the maturity of that process to happen where people aren't just reacting against the suppression that happened for so long. Am I dealing with your question? Oh, I think so. I think that um, in the traditional sense, like in, in India, for example, in the family, the woman is seen as the core and the central part of the family. And by her being a conscious, a dharmic mother and a dharmic wife and a dharmic homemaker, she was doing a yoga that brought her closer to God than if the man was being a lousy businessman or even, you know, I mean, it was because people understood individual differences and each person played their part as dharma. We've lost that a little bit in, in our understanding. But, uh, and that's what I say about the maturity. When we mature, we will understand which of the things we threw over out of a wrong interpretation of equality. And we will begin to honor what is true to each human being's needs to, to manifest. But I think it's absolutely right. that, And that's part of why women weren't historically pointed out as the spiritual teachers because their role wasn't as a teacher, their role was as a support system. That was their way they became saints. They were saints through their supporting, not through the front work. The front work was, I mean, you, you, I, I laugh as an anthropologist when I've studied those cultures where the women kept the family together and they carried the wheat and they did all that and the men sat in the marketplace exchanging beads. And the men were the important people and the women were treated like, you know, nothing. And yet they were the root of the whole system. And I could feel in India that the woman is much more the center of the whole social structure and that her spiritual... Um, Consciousness, because every home in India and the villages I live in has its own puja room. The woman keeps the puja room. The woman does all the services. The woman is concerned with all of these issues. And she becomes the spiritual connection in the situation. And when you look at most of these gurus, like Maharaji, most of the people who came to see him were the women. The men came and discussed their crops and things like that. The women came and did arti and did puja around him all the time. And so, 
Um, I think that women have a very challenging time in the West at this moment to find their way through, to find what they must honor in their beings and what they must demand of the society to be heard. I'm just taking questions from the group at the moment until we get through everybody. Ramdas? Yes. Yes. Uh, you've answered uh, our questions. Thank you for that. 